Welcome back to the um, closing uh, plenary session for our December 2021 CNI meeting. And before introducing this session, um, I just want to take a minute or two to, um, to uh, remind you that in this new and different world we're in now, it's a little, it, it feels like closing the conference is a little different because the conference really spanned two interrelated events, a virtual event last week and an in-person event um, uh, that uh, took place over the last two days. And in that sense, where in the past I would close the conference and wish you all safe travels and we would all leave behind what we've done here, a great deal of our conference is still going to be there waiting to be explored and examined. And I would invite you in the coming days and weeks, as your time and interests allow, to continue to explore the wealth of materials from the virtual meeting. You'll see a number of connections between what we've heard and talked about here and what we heard and talked about there. The two really were designed to complement each other, not, to, not for one to serve as a substitute. With that, I also want to just take a minute to thank people. I want to thank all of our presenters, not just the presenters who've been here in person with us, but the presenters who contributed to our virtual meeting, and even a few virtual presenters that have contributed to this meeting but couldn't be here in physical presence. So please um, join me in a round of applause for those folks. We really, we, we obviously we can't do it without all of those presenters and contributors. And I also just want to take a minute to publicly thank the CNI team who have worked incredibly hard and had to be incredibly flexible as we've uh, navigated our way from in-person to virtual and back to a uh, mixed um, in-person and virtual environment. Um, it's been a lot of work and a lot of making it up as we go along and um, I'm actually just delighted at how smoothly everything has gone. So I, I really think they um, deserve a big round of applause. And with that, let me turn to our closing plenary. Um, this is really something quite extraordinary, I think, and I hope you'll agree after you uh, see it. Um, I started hearing about this project uh, shortly after the pandemic hit when we started doing a series of executive roundtables trying to understand research resilience and the effects of the pandemic on the research enterprise. And um, Keith pointed me at what, what at that point was a very early um, uh, set of conversations between Carnegie Mellon and um, the Emerald Cloud Lab, uh, which is a company out in the Bay Area that was founded by a couple of um, Carnegie Mellon graduates. And since then, the project has grown in ambition, I think, um, and really genuinely turned into something quite extraordinary, as you'll hear. Um, Keith and his colleagues at Carnegie Mellon have been incredibly kind uh, to um, allow me uh, an opportunity to get somewhat familiar with the details of the project. And um, really, the more you learn about it, the more fascinating it gets, I'll just say. So we have three speakers today. Two of them are here in person, Keith Webster and Rebecca Dorge. And 
The other speaker is going to, through the magic of technology, join us from uh, the Bay Area. He is um, Brian Fraser, and he is a co-founder of Emerald Lab. And with that, I'm going to go sit down and watch the presentation, and um, I'll come back up at the um, end. I have a couple of questions that we might chat about a little, and then I'll moderate a Q&A session with all the folks here. So, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca, um, and I'm super thrilled today to um, talk to you about um, how we are envisioning automated science at Carnegie Mellon, and I'm super thrilled that I have the Dean of Libraries at Carnegie Mellon and uh, an alumni, Brian Frezza, and co-founder of, of Emerald Cloud Lab um, with me. It, it's just really fun to give these joint talks, and, and my understanding is we're going to have a panel for questions later, um, so let, let's have a lot of fun because this is, this is really exciting to think about. So I'm Rebecca, I'm Dean of the Mellon College of Science. I joined Carnegie Mellon five years ago from Purdue University. I always like a disclaimer up front that I am a statistician uh, who does uh, quantitative genetics and uh, I get excited about reproducibility and experimental design. So, um, <laughs> thank you. And so if I go off on a tangent, somebody reel me back in, because this is, as for a statistician, what I'm about to tell you is super exciting. So I don't need to tell this particular audience about how um, massive data is just, you know, it's, it's everywhere around us. And AI technologies, I mean, you've heard today, um, are essential to analyze and make sense. Um, of the data that we're collecting. And then the, the disciplinary boundaries are lower than ever and people are working on very, very complex problems across disciplinary boundaries. And really, the, the best way to help, there's two things that I need, need to do to help you focus this. If you think about life science research and think about the cell phone, life science research hasn't changed in over 100 years. Yes, the instruments have gotten better, but we still need human beings to go in the lab and do things wrong 10 times and collect a bunch of bad data. We still can't reproduce it once it's published, right? Cell phones, they, they originated in 2007 and we're all walking around with this handheld computer. We, can, we have self-driving cars, yet science as we perform science hasn't changed in hundreds and hundreds of years. So this is what I wanna tell you about, the uh, Carnegie Mellon University Cloud Lab. We are building the first remote controlled laboratory. So scientists do not need to be in the lab. You can be in your office, you can be at home, you can be on the beach. Um, and you design your experiments using code and you submit that code to the cloud lab where the experiments are done uh, 24 7, 365. Very much un unlike graduate students and, and postdocs, they don't need to sleep, they don't need to eat, um, and they don't need to go to the bathroom. So everything is traceable, which points to re re reproducible science. So everything about your experiment is captured. You have the code that created it. You have the environment, the humidity, the temperature. You know the life cycle of each instrument. You have the, the parameters of each instrument. You know when things are out of bounds. And so when you want to reproduce your experiment, you can reproduce your experiment from the parameter file that goes with that particular experiment. Now I'm just gonna get you thinking ahead because this is a lot of fun to think about. Imagine a day when you submit a paper to a journal and you submit your paper, your manuscript for a review, you submit your data because it's required, but you also submit your parameter file for your experiment and the code for your experiment because it was done on the cloud lab. So anyone who questions your data or wants to reproduce it, um, they have everything they need. This ultimately, I think, will move science forward much faster, much more efficiently, and much cheaper. So this, the Carnegie Mellon Cloud Lab is, is fashioned after Emerald Cloud Lab, which was founded by DJ Kleinbaum and Brian Frezza, who's joining us today. Uh, they are alum of the Mellon College of Science and Carnegie Mellon. And this is a partnership between a uh, for-profit and a uh, university. So when the next slide, we will actually start thinking about what the differences between running a for-profit and, the, and uh, having a cloud lab in academia. 
So if I could have the video, that would be great. And I see some of you on your cell phones already. And the scale of our work has been metered by the long hours required at the bench. It's time to change that. Emerald Cloud Lab is a remote-controlled life science laboratory that allows scientists to execute their experiments without being anchored to a physical lab. In a cloud lab, experiments are driven by issuing commands over the internet, which are then run in a vast, highly automated central facility. With an ECL account, you have full control over every aspect of how your experiments are conducted. Control the transfers of volumes from less than a microliter to 20 liters, and the transfers of solids with masses from micrograms to kilograms. There are over 150 models of best-in-class instrumentation online at the ECL. ECL facilities run your experiments on demand 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, leaving just hours between the moment you conceive your experiment and the moment you receive your results. It's not unusual for an ECL user to be orchestrating dozens of protocols simultaneously, far more than one could ever manage in a traditional laboratory. When you're ready, you can build scripts which automatically execute a series of experiments of arbitrary complexity, reproduce results, or process the data and generate reports for you to analyze. As chemists and biologists, our minds are capable of moving faster and further than the laboratory has ever allowed us. Take your seat in the command center. Transcend the lab. So over the course of the last three years, um, I've talked to a lot of people about automating science and they're all very polite and they shake their head. But that video really helps you hone in on what we're talking about. Um, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, this will be the first academic cloud lab in the world. Um, and uh, to tell you the truth, I spent probably a good six months to a year saying, why do we need one of these in academia? Can we keep it busy and is it worth the investment? So we had a working group of uh, scientists across campus. This is a university initiative. Um, it's about $40 million, so it's a serious, a serious commitment. And we had engineers, computer scientists, statisticians, foundational scientists in our working group, and they made a wish list for me. And the wish list has about, I think it's 211 instruments. It's about 11 instruments more than what Emerald Cloud has in their uh, facility in San Francisco. And we are building one of these. Um, during COVID, COVID actually helped us make our case to the university because we taught undergrad and grad classes using the Emerald Cloud Lab facility in, in California. Um, the faculty transitioned their research. We had trained faculty prior to COVID. Those faculty were good to go, immediately transitioned. Um, and then we kept training faculty and grad students and postdocs during COVID. Um, so the three month shutdown that most people experienced for their research labs in academia um, a large portion of our research kept moving forward because of the generosity of Emerald. Um, so this particular cloud lab, it's academic. It's, it, you think about it in a very different way than you do a for-profit lab. But in our business planning and our business model, we did, we, we, sa we um, saved out, is a good word, 20% of the total for the Pittsburgh life science um, ecosystem. We very much want to give back to the community, and we feel that startup companies, if they don't have to set up their wet labs and set up their own computing, it's fast to fail or it's fast to succeed. So ultimately, this is going to support Pittsburgh, which leaves 80% for teaching, research, training, and so on. Uh, we have faculty who have put in grant applications already, and in all transparency, the federal agencies don't know what to do with the budgets that, cl that budget for cloud labs. So we are now on a socialization project of uh, going coming back to Washington and, or being on Zoom and um, doing exactly this sort of talk. 
And then there, there we are already publishing papers, uh, and and the the publications are have been easier than I expected, and so we have we have publications coming out. So under one roof, imagine that you have 200 plus instruments. Uh, your your uh, faculty are not physically in the lab. I don't want them on the, in the lab. Actually, uh, this facility will not live on campus. And uh, so looking at this diagram, each of these little gray boxes is one of those 211 instruments. And the cool thing about this particular um, setup is that we can parallelize science. What you're seeing in this picture are, you have blue, yellow, and red. Those are three different workflows, three completely different experiments, all running at the same time. And last week I was giving a talk and somebody said, how many experiments can you run? And the statistician in me wanted to do the calculation for them, you know, 211 choose two, 211 choose, but uh, we, uh, capacity wise, we think upwards of about 12 experiments at the same time. And, and, and realize that that not every, not every scientist is going to uh, utilize the, the facility 24-7, 365. Some of these experiments will be fairly quick. So this is the concept for the cloud lab. And so as I mentioned before, I spent a lot of time saying, why do we need a cloud lab? Well, it increases uh, reproducibility. It uh, deals with reproducibility. It uh, research productivity. Um, imagine not being limited by the grants that you write and the instruments that you can afford to buy. You can do your science. The only, the only limitation is human ingenuity, not money, not uh, the, the instruments that you have available to you. Uh, ECL estimates say that their customers um, have experienced up to 7x increase in research productivity. We don't have this estimate for academics yet because our lab is not up and, up and, and running. We conservatively estimate that uh, we will publish two times the, the research paper in the same amount of time. Stay tuned, we'll update that. And then reproducibility. How exciting is this for statisticians? You can just have a field day with this. And then we have open science. So improve collaboration. People don't have to come to your lab anymore to learn certain techniques. If you are a scientist who has bad hands instead of golden hands, you, you are no longer restricted um, to the it being in the lab. Um, knowledge sharing. You can share protocols. You can share experiments. Instead of reproducing or guessing what you've done, your collaborators can just go to the, the code, tweak, move forward, and the discovery science is that much faster. So this is, I think this cloud lab really is a great example of open source. Um, educating the next generation of scientists, that's our business. That's where we think this is going to go. Carnegie Mellon is a first mover in a lot of different things. So um, this is a moment in time for science that we don't think we're going to get back. So we are capturing this and, and guiding it. Doc democratization of science. I have a lot of colleagues at under-resourced universities, and I know a lot of people who grew up in under-resourced communities. If they, with an internet connection, you level the playing field on science. Everyone can do top-notch science and so again, it's open source, right? We're no, I was just in the previous talk where a woman from India, you know, it speeded up the code and, and uh, made it more efficient. It's the same exact example for a cloud lab. And then I'm not interested in building a static facility at Carnegie Mellon. I'm interested in starting this facility and then engaging the scientists and the engineers so that we can build the next generation of robots and we can build the next generation of in instruments and we can put on top of that active learning so that we can do our science more efficiently. We don't have to do every possible combination of things because the, the, the uh, algorithms learn as you go. And I have a couple of ex uh, examples later on for you. So this is why we need an academic cloud lab. I know that we are going to create new disciplines that I can't even imagine. I know that things will happen that I can't even imagine yet, but it certainly is fun to set it up. Meet Dima. Um, in 2019, when I couldn't get the Board of Trustees to listen to me fully, I went back to um, <laughs> Keith. Anyway, I'm not going to, I'm being videoed. Um, <laughs> Keith, Keith, went, uh, Keith went back, yeah. I went back to, the, to my office and said, I need a really smart PhD student who doesn't know how to code. And so we looked around. Here is Dima. Um, Dima works on synthetic DNA. So DNA, A, T, Cs, and Gs, but you create it on your own, and you need to know what the order of the base pairs are because you're interested in how it folds. 
Synthetic DNAs are very difficult. It's very time consuming. And typically Dima, who is an expert at this point, um, he could synthesize about three a week. We sent Dima to California for a month, trained him, embedded him in Emerald, and he was able to um, synthesize hundreds of these PNAs a week. And when he came back, I said, so how long did the code take once you, once you were trained? And he said, I really didn't need to go to California, Rebecca. It only took me 20 minutes to write the code. So really smart person who doesn't know how to code was trained in about four sessions. And it is fairly um, in-depth training, but once you're trained, you're, you're good to go. And the good news about Dima is he now works at Emerald Cloud Lab after he received his PhD. So we also got him a job. And then more recently, um, this is a publication that just came out in 2021, like maybe a month or so ago. This is Olis, and Olis, um, his work, this particular paper is um, on the MRI agent, agent that you in, are injected before they do an MRI, and typically it takes a lot of time to find these, these different compositions. And so if you considered 50,000 different compositions, these scientists, they would just say, that's not worth the money, it's too much time, we're not doing it. Using AI and active learning, learning as you go from the experiments that you're doing and the results that you're getting, Olis and his colleagues found um, that by testing less, that they were able to test less than 400 polymers because they're testing as they go and they're eliminating things in a week's time. And this is just, there, we're able to do science, and this is just proof of concept. We're able to do science that before they wouldn't even consider doing. So how will the Cloud Lab transform science, reproducibility, um, productivity, open science? It, it, if we had one of these Cloud Labs, labs in an academic open environment during COVID, and we had them around the country and around the world talking to each other, we could have addressed things, and I think the vaccines for, for COVID have been spectacularly fast, but it could have been done probably even faster. And then active learning. Learning from your experimental data as you go. This is, this is the, the pinnacle of AI, I think. And I, don't, I, just, I just think we're, we're at the tip of the iceberg on that one. And then how will this transform society Cloud Labs allow you to pivot literally in a moment's time. If you need more access, you plug in more access, more instruments. If someone develops a new instrument and you've, you've tested it and you want to give everyone else access, you plug it in and everyone else has access. So it's flexible. This environment is flexible. It's open. Um, it is the workforce development of the future. Uh, because this is the way things are going, and it is democratizing science for sure. So where are we at Carnegie Mellon? Um, we are doing this, first of all, uh, which is really exciting to be able to not just lay it out, but I can tell you that we're doing it. Um, we will have our uh, facility up and running this time next year, fall of 2022. It's an academic uh, recharge center, so we are going to learn how to run one of these in academia. The home of the Cloud Lab is not on campus, as I mentioned before. It didn't need a fancy, new, expensive building. So it's housed in a building that Carnegie Mellon owns. Um, if anyone is, is familiar with Pittsburgh, it's about 10 minutes from campus, and it's uh, in an area called Bakery Square, which is where Google's headquarter office is in Pittsburgh. The architects are chosen. The management team is hired. Uh, I walk the space, which is super exciting. Uh, we needed high base space. so. This is terrific. We know that the, the floors can take the weight of the equipment. We have designed the lab. This is what it looks like. It's a little bit bigger than the one in uh, California, which is, which is extra exciting for me. Uh, we have a, a little bit more than 200 instruments. And so we think about the future. What is this going to do for science? It's open. It's collaborative. We're, we're training the next generation of uh, scientists, for sure. This platform is expandable. Um, in ways that, again, I can't imagine. Um, and we know that we're creating new disciplines going forward, and we're streamlining the flow of technology and knowledge. So um, the previous talk that I heard uh, had a prediction of the next 10 years. My prediction in the next 10 years is that this won't be the only academic cloud lab. 
There will be other cloud labs, uh, government academic facilities that are connected and talking to each other and sharing data in a very open way. And this, this is the moment in time for science that the cell phone had and the self-driving car had. Thank you. Oh, yes, sorry, I was, I, it was, Brian, are you out there? There he is. Hey, Brian, how are you, how are you doing? I, can you see me? I, I can. Okay, Hello. great. Hi, you're on. Excellent. So following up on uh, Rebecca's wonderful introduction to the academic cloud, I'm going to take you through, we're live in the South San Francisco facility. So I'm going to take you through what this, Technology looks like an action, talk a little bit about uh, the birth of it and how it came about. Um, and then give you some background on, you know, where the statistics come from, for instance, on the operational capabilities and all that. And so we're driving around now what is a, it's on the order of 13,000, 14,000 square foot facility in San Francisco. And uh, as, uh, as Rebecca mentioned, there's a larger one going in, in Pittsburgh, more to the tune of 16,000 square feet. It's home to around uh, 200 plus different types of devices, uh, although there's redundancy on a lot of devices, so that like the total number is larger than that. So those are unique types of devices. So that may be like a specific model of mass spec, a specific model of liquid handler, DNMR, uh, things like the even speed backing is here. So every manner of uh, small and large equipment is is packed into the same facility. And all of that is put under the control of one single software operating system. So there's one software platform, which I'll just really briefly show you. We'll go through a little bit in a moment. Uh, that's designed to control all of this. And really, this, this technology is developed over the better part of about 10 years. Uh, started actually at a, a previous startup that myself and my co-founder had worked on and then spun out into Memo Cloud Lab as a commercial platform uh, more recently, uh, about six years ago, I think, when that's been out happened. And really where the, the birth of it came from was in grappling with the reproducibility problem that everyone has been doing, rather than approach it in a sort of classical manner, which is to say, standing kind of behind scientists, taking notes on what they're doing uh, and saying, uh, how do we capture all the information on, on what they're doing and, and then try to re repeat what they're doing exactly. We approached it very differently. So myself and my co-founder both had backgrounds in um, and that's the classical sciences. So we both did chemistry in graduate school. Uh, he was at Stanford, I was at Scripps. But in undergrad, we did, in addition to doing chemistry and biology, we did computer science at Carnegie Mellon, back when that was a very, very new field. Now it's a, a normal thing to do that. Um, but we thought about it very much from the, the history of the early days of computing and said, well, there was a transition state that had to happen uh, back in the 1940s where computers were human people at one point that you would give calculations to do in a room full of people, right? We would go through by hand and try to calculate something. And, and uh, there was a, a movement, of course, to turn that into a, an automated, at first mechanical and then eventually electronic environment uh, to, to compute these things. And in trying to approach that problem, you, you wouldn't go about that by standing over the shoulder of the human computer, the human calculator is doing those calculations and try to record everything they're doing. The way you approach it is a little bit different where um, you would sit down and try to come up with a baseline instruction set to the machinery that says, these are all the actions that sort of unit level actions one can take. And then a composition of those unit le level actions is the actual, uh, is gonna be the actual end computation that you're doing. And as long as that instruction set is sufficient to cover the space of everything that's possible, then you should have a, you can say with completeness that this is a way to completely uh, get, the, to get the electronic environment to uh, recapitulate what would be happening with the humans, right? And so that's very different because you, you have a known closure condition there right up front where you can say, well, is the instruction set sufficient to carry out the task I want to know? You know that before you even roll into the exercise that that's a true statement. Whereas when you're standing you know, behind someone trying to write down everything they're doing, you never really have an a priori way to sit down and say, is this enough information? You can't just look at the information set and say, is it complete? And we have this, this same level of frustration where you try to be as careful as possible in all your note taking, 
but then you could look at those notes and, and from the notes themselves say, oh, I definitely have enough to, to get this exact same thing to run. So when we first built this instruction set, um, it was about connecting all the different instruments you're seeing here. So that's, uh, as you can imagine, a massive software undertaking to get every piece of software here talking to the same central platform. It also meant that there's a lab execution system, which is managing traffic throughout the facility. So it knows about the many, many different experiments that might be going on simultaneously and make sure that they're not going to collide, looking for resources at the same time. So you can imagine there's a complex resource management system there. And then there's also the human element as well. So we have the traffic samples between uh, the stores onto the different instruments and elements here. We have to do a bit of sample preparation, some of which uh, we can do with the sort of best in class automation that we're able to get access to, uh, but also some of which is going to be somewhat manual. Some things like, say, filtering uh, a, a liter of solution is going to have to be a human hooking up to a pump, uh, the filter at the end of the day. But that stuff can still be proceduralized. Uh, and controlled remotely in the sense that you are issuing instruction on how that is going to happen. And then that's managed internally in the facility the same way you would any other uh, sort of industrial process. And so the collection of those things end up building the cloud lab that you see here. And what's novel about this, I think more than anything, is what you don't see here. It's not necessarily the instrumentation that you have connected. A lot of us, you have access to in your own laboratories. What's novel here is that the, the people who are driving this facility are never in it. So they're scattered across the globe, most of which are in North America. There's a fair amount in Europe that use this every day. Um, and I think the farthest one is there's a, there's a larger group in Australia that will, will log on at, at very odd times for us and, and, uh, and, and queue their experiments that way. The way people are getting the sort of productivity numbers that were quoted there, that 7x number, is twofold. One is, uh, of course, as Rebecca mentioned, is the parallelism. So if you're just operating all this stuff remotely by issuing instructions into the facility, uh, you can, of course, issue parallel instructions. It's just like in a data center spinning up more than one server to do more than one calculation. You can spin up many instruments simultaneously to get many different uh, protocols running at once. And so that's a very common use case uh, for the users on the system. And that's a lot of where their efficiency numbers are coming from. The other part is interesting, and that's about, you know, once you've, you've taken the exercise of being able to capture the execution of these experiments sort of out of space and out of time with where the experimenter is, you can keep them running 24 seven. So the experimenter can be thinking ahead about what they want to be doing in the days to come, can put that into their queue, and then that stuff will continue running over nights and over weekends, uh, and, and the 24 seven environment will not stop, right? And so good experimenters on the, on the system who are taking uh, most effective use of it will queue experiments for many days in advance. Uh, they may be sitting in their queue, and what will happen is they'll be running, say in this case, they've got this account has 12 simultaneous experiments running. But you can see they have more than that in their queue. And so if they want to get these others to run, they can sort of set the backlog order that they want. But what will happen there is even if at four in the morning, any one of these finishes, it will roll on automatically into the next one. And so part of where that efficiency comes from, as long as you're planning ahead a little bit on those experiments, they continue to run uh, continuously. You also need a dynamic environment. And so a lot of the technology development was around this idea that you have to get things up and running very fast and you have to have sort of as close as possible to live control. Now you're not going to be there when it actually runs, if that happens in the middle of the night or, or when you're not at your computer, when it doesn't switch from one experiment to another. Uh, but you're also going to be not making decisions like months in advance of what uh, experiment you want. Because a lot of that stuff is going to be based on the sort of day-to-day -day activity of you get the results from yesterday on how your purification went and then that's how you're going to decide how to do the next setup the next day. And so part of this technology and, and setting it up, the, the real challenge here is that uh, more than half of the jobs that come in on this facility are completely novel to us. We've never seen them before when they show up. We get them running uh, up, up and running on average within five hours. Ten hours is kind of the point at which alarms start to fire. That's been sitting in the queue for too long. And so that really moves at the pace of research such that you're able to you know, come in with a day's or, day or two worth of experiments, get them into the queue, uh, as they're running, they're going to come back. The next day you come in, you have a whole new set of data to look at and you set of decisions to make on what to do next, um, but you don't have to plan away in advance. As Rebecca said, the other big part of uh, the value of being able to run this out of space and out of time is that you can use the, the sort of industrial might of that centralization to democratize the whole thing because it's a shared access facility. So in a sense, it means that as the users are all around the world, uh, you can pack everything into one space uh, ahead of time, 
run it most efficiently in terms of all the maintenance and, and the GXP level qualifications that we're doing with all the instruments ahead of time. Uh, so that by the time you get to the machine, you're, you're using something that's in sort of pristine condition. But you also pack it with a diversity of equipment, which means that the researchers don't have to plan vastly in advance, uh, you know, which equipment they want to want. We sort of go out and we, we often refer to this facility as sort of Noah's Ark as like one of everything packed in here so that you can try it first, see if it's going to work well for your application and then move on, you know, immediately to something else that doesn't work or stick with that and scale it up if, if you want to continue using that instrument. Uh, but that doesn't become a, sort of a major part of the process is the shopping for instrumentation, the trying to get it online, the fighting to work with a single piece of machinery because you've sunk some very large percentage of your budget into it. In this case, it's just sort of try everything in parallel, see what works well, and then continue along with that. And so that's sort of one of the more intangible ways I think we've seen speeding up of the research that people are using on the system here is that kind of fail fast and move on quickly. So if you're, you're attempting a new purification, for example, you'll try four or five different techniques in parallel on the same day. And maybe one or two of them looks promising, the other, the other ones don't, and you sort of abandon the ones that don't, and you go with the ones that look promising. But at that point, you haven't you know, sort of sunk budgets and months into getting that equipment in the door uh, to go that direction. So that's the, the basics of, of how it operates. As Rebecca mentioned as well, part of what took a long time on the technology development was getting to the point where we could have this environment be run by someone who has no computer science training whatsoever. So our bread and butter user, and, and certainly in pharma, is a chemist and biologist who knows, of course, their experimentation very well, but doesn't necessarily know anything about coding. Uh, and in, in some sense, we're sort of teaching them that in that their experiments at the end of the day will get reduced to a set of code, uh, but that will work through a, a, a point and click, no code type interface that we set up which is very heavily based on AI, but it, don't get too excited. It's an expert system, so it's like 1980s AI. Uh, but that's what we use to, to help design the experiments where you'll start to set up an experiment, maybe give, uh, give the system like what samples, for instance, I'm purifying here by HPLC. And what it'll do is take me through each of these options and give me sort of suggestions on what they could be. And then these suggestions are adaptable and changeable. And I can go through and graphically say, oh, I want, you know, a different gradient here. And so I'm just going to push buttons to sort of change them. And I, I get my nice uh, interface here. And you kind of see as I'm messing around with this graphically, on the right there is the actual piece of code that's going to come out of this. And so we're trying to make it easy to make that bridge where uh, you are effectively just designing your experiment from the point of view of like, what would it look like graphically to set this thing up? But everything you're doing always result, results in an end command, which is composable so that you can take these things and build them into, for instance, larger scripts, where you have a series of experiments running back to back to back. You can take parts of this command, like say we have this gradient calculation here, and this is, I've just hard coded something in here, but you could write a function, for instance, that calculates how this might go based on some property of the samples and substitute it in. So the more, even though you're, you're up and running, like we said in the, in the four training sessions, uh, uh, to use the whole graphical system, the more advanced users very quickly, and especially in academia we've seen, uh, have been playing around with doing things like writing code that writes its own experimental execution. So it's like self-optimizing code that will try many different experiments, come back with something that has more of an optimal parameter set for what you want and, and go from there. So that, that's sort of, a, in a nutshell, what the environment looks like. I don't want to take up too much of the time because I know uh, Keith is going to follow up here. But I'm sure there are lots of questions that will come out of this. This is very new technology that the world is just getting used to. We could not be more thrilled that uh, Carnegie Mellon is opening up this technology. To date, we've mostly been working with pharma companies behind closed doors and uh, under a mountain of NDAs, not telling anyone what we were doing for the work. But I think that in the long run, it's pretty clear to see for anyone who uses this technology how valuable this democratization would be of these techniques. When you can pass on experimental methods to people uh, in software, where it really is just a series of commands that you push a button to reproduce on the same equipment, even potentially the same facility, using the same materials in exactly the same manner that it was run the first time. Um, that can be a major game changer to the way we put together even uh, scientific protocols and the way we, we deal with results. Importantly, too, as we build this database of, of results, I think Keith's going to talk a bit more about this. Um, it's I think everyone is at, at the point right now, where we're all fighting to make sure all the data from the, the publications are, are available and out there. Right? That's, that's the most obvious first step. You can't do anything without that. But I would argue that the, the very next step that everyone is, is gonna realize is in the future becomes the, the most important thing to move forward 
is that any piece of data you're going to see in a system, if it's not actionably tied to the methods used to generate it, and by that I mean I don't have an easy way to go back and reproduce this experiment on my own without having to spend a month or so of fighting, without trying to get access to the same equipment, dealing with the fact that there's ambiguity in the expression of how this is done, stuff that's just generally not captured by the way uh, you know, someone has communicated it in prose. If instead every piece of data in your database is tied to an electronic method that you can pull up, push a button, get to run a facility, change one or two parameters, uh, you know, do derivative experiments off it immediately that same day, uh, it's a very, very different environment. So a world where the data itself is always inexorably tied to the, the method, methodology that was used to generate it from the point of view of like, I'm, I'm less than a day away from, from pushing a button and getting that experiment back is definitely a, a very new and exciting world. And something I think that this academic environment is gonna be able to take advantage of it much more so even than the, uh, the, the industrial environment has been able to, to date. So I think that's it for me. I'll be around for final questions. I'm sure this leads to more questions than it, it does answers at the beginning, but hopefully it's a beginning discussion for a lot of people here to wade into this new technology. Thank you, Brian. Okay, we'll be back for questions with Brian in a few moments' time. If we could switch back to the slides, please. Great, thanks. Uh, so as you might imagine, and, and that was great seeing a Dalek's eye view of a cloud lab. Uh, I don't know why the Doctor Who producers didn't capture that one years ago. Uh, but if we think about the cloud lab from our perspective in the university libraries, where part of our charge is overseeing the end-to-end -end approach to open science at CMU and managing the products of research, clearly the sort of productivity gains that we anticipate from this facility are going to have huge impacts on our roles in capturing, curating, sharing the products of that research. Brian mentioned the Cloud Lab Command Center, which drives everything that you've seen, the challenge for us is in an open science environment, how do we interplay with the work we've already been doing and how do we meet our obligations as research funder mandates begin to pick up? And for us, it really is about pipelines. How do we connect things we are already working with into the ECL command center? This is very much work in progress, but just to give you an example of the sorts of things we are exploring. We were early adopters, the first university um, to adopt protocols.io, and many of our researchers have built their workflows around protocols.io. How can we feed that work into the ECL command center? At the other end, our elegantly named institutional repository, Kilt Hub, you get the riff on GitHub, which sits on top of a fixture platform. How do we derive data and other records from the Cloud Lab Command Center into the repository environment? One thing we've already determined is that almost certainly there will be just too much stuff to capture everything. So how do we decide what comes, what doesn't? How do we help researchers make that decision? It's, it's not a decision we will make, but how do we provide the decision matrix to support that? Lorcan had to leave for a flight, so this was a slightly wasted slide, but I always have to, to throw in this one. Um, many of you will be familiar with the evolving scholarly record work from OCLC, and I think the Cloud Lab really exemplifies the focus here, that traditionally we were really focusing on the outcomes of research, the end of project reports, journal articles, conference presentations. But in a digital research environment, everything is susceptible to capture and curation. The products of the research process, the products and outputs of the aftermath of research. And we're going to be dealing with that on a substantial scale as the Cloud Lab comes to fruition. I'd like to say that we had anticipated this back in 2015 when the university strategic plan pointed to this. Um, we knew that the data deluge was coming. We hadn't anticipated in what shape or form, but it now very much is in front of us. And we recognize that as the scholarly record evolves, we need to be at the forefront of supporting the entire infrastructure that is at play. A couple of years ago, we modeled out 
our perspective on open science at CMU and, and the graphic at the top is our end-to-end -end approach from the research design through to the post-experimental reuse and reproducibility work. And this maps out the university library's approach to open science for the university community. And you can see in the boxes underneath the different tools and platforms that we have put in place to support that end-to-end -end approach. Uh, we see that as particularly critical as funders begin to really articulate expectations for sharing curation across not only publications and data, but I anticipate code and other artifacts. We absolutely need to be ready to understand that. And one of the things we've been careful to do is to shy away from a platform by platform approach, but rather to begin with the end to end mindset and then find the best partners and collaborators to meet different use cases across that workflow. Open science is very much at the forefront at the moment. We've heard about the National Academy's recently released toolkit that builds upon earlier work, um, I think in 2018, the, the vision for 21st century research. But the pandemic undoubtedly has accelerated the drive towards open science. UNESCO, amongst others, has really talked about the importance of information sharing through open science and the pandemic has illustrated the gains as we think about trans-border or cross-border sharing and the industry higher education sharing of research outcomes. UNESCO recently, I think three weeks ago, released its final recommendation on open science. Do have a look out for that. I'm, I'm not going to belabor the point here. I just want to spend a couple of moments talking in greater detail about our approach to open science at CMU. And if, if you can think about what I'm seeing in the context of what you've heard about our Cloud Lab facility. We have five pillars to our open science promise to the university. The first of those is a suite of tools. The slides will be available. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. We very much have adapted and adopted the open science framework as a core part of our approach to open science at CMU, widely adopted many hundreds, if not thousands of users across the institution. And then we have carefully identified partners whose business models and products align with our approach, such as protocols and lab archives. I've mentioned Kilt Hub already as our comprehensive repository that so far seems able to accommodate anything that has bits and bytes and hopefully could accommodate atoms in due course. At the tail end, we have been promoting open access agreements. Um, I've talked about these in a number of fora, so I won't go into that in detail. Our second prong is that of training. We offer a number of carpentries workshops every semester. These are always oversubscribed, and we could be running these, I suspect, every day and still find that we couldn't meet all the demand. We complement the carpentries, which typically are two or three days in duration, with one, two, three hour workshops being delivered by the university libraries in computational frameworks such as R, Python, Shell, and Git. And these satisfy people who need just a quick hit of how do I do a particular activity rather than a broad based introduction. And we are beginning now to work on series of um, workshops to suit a particular business case. So reproducible research, we will pull together four or five different workshops into a curriculum that meets particular needs. And we are now delivering um, discipline-specific training workshops. We just completed a series in neuroimaging. We have a series in genomics coming next semester. Third um, component is our broader outreach events, um, artificial intelligence for data discovery and reuse started as a three-day conference just before the pandemic. We went online last year. We took a, a, a skip this year because we had core faculty members on leave, but we hope in 2022 to resume ADER. Our Open Science Symposium, which we run in partnership with Mellon College of Science, 
Similarly is a broad-based event that attracts an international audience. Uh, collaboration is something that we found is very much at the heart of our open science approach. Our data collaborations laboratory pre-pandemic was held in the library once a week, bringing together data producers, data scientists to share data to tackle data questions. That moved to Zoom and has continued without missing a session throughout the pandemic. Uh, we know that the data collab will continue for some time, but we are seeing a lot of demand to introduce also a coding collab, particularly for the, the reasons that Brian described with the Emerald um, Toolkit. And we're seeing a lot of interest in broader community engagement, supporting citizen scientists around and about campus, and we're happy to add that to our collaboration framework. And finally, we are trying to wrestle with questions of outreach and assessment. How do we make sense of this? Uh, recently, the Open Science team has developed a logic model to try and weave a way through the question of what are the long-term outcomes and impacts of this work, rather than just spin up a platform and hope that people will use it. We're viewing this as a gradient of different practices, recognizing that one size doesn't fit all. Different disciplines have different approaches to the balance between private and open or public data, private and open science, and we recognize that different research product projects also will bring with them different expectations. So, for example, we could imagine in our work with Protocols IO, different approaches depending on the circumstances in which the project is being conducted. And we're now turning our thoughts to metrics to help us understand how this is playing out. Are we achieving the institution's aspirations around open science? A lot of work beginning to get underway. This is something that we hope we can um, develop into a toolkit that we can share more broadly leveraging and building upon the National Academy's work that I mentioned earlier, and really trying to answer questions such as, what difference do our services make to a researcher? How much time are they saving? How many grants are they able to attract based upon the models that we are putting in place? A lot more information is available on our website. We produce a monthly newsletter. Um, if you go to the link on the bottom right, you can find back issues and sign up to receive a monthly mailing of that newsletter. My colleagues, Melanie Ganey, who is a neuroscientist, Hua Jin Wang, who is a cell biologist, they're both faculty in the university libraries. They would be delighted to hear from anyone who wants to talk more about our service model. They did a great presentation at Virtual CNI last week, and you can connect with them at the email address or the Twitter hashtag. With that, I am going to um, sit down and let Cliff lead the conversation. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you all, including you, Brian. I know you're out there somewhere um, for a wonderful overview. Um, there, there is so much we can talk about here, and um, I'm. I'm definitely going to leave some time for questions from the audience, but I thought I'd start with a couple of questions since I've had a few months to um, mull on this. Um, so obviously this is not um, a complete replacement for individual faculty labs. Uh, so th this, this fits beautifully with some workflows. There are other workflows that are very different. Um, can you give any kind of a sense of what disciplines are best covered um, by the cloud lab that you're envisioning putting in, um, and also some sense of um, you know maybe the percentage of faculty that are affected by that are that are going to really uh, be affected by this? Right. So, do I think of all that all of science is automatable? No. Um, do I think that we train students without ever stepping foot in a lab? No. But I do think very much like teaching statistics, 
you do the analysis of variance tables once or twice by hand, and then you appreciate the software. <laughs> so I see this very much the same way. Um, with respect to usage, I think across camp, I mean, one of, one of the things that I talked to Brian and, and DJ a lot was I don't want to build this and have it sit idle. So can, can Carnegie Mellon University keep this thing busy? And they were very polite, and they said, Rebecca, between the, the PIs, the labs, the faculty, the courses, grad and undergrad, the postdocs, the graduate students, and at Carnegie Mellon, the undergrads, yes, they're all doing independent research. Um, so I think about, I think it's fair to say in the first two years, upwards of 50% of the science that we do and the teaching that we're doing, so I'm including that um, in there. And then as this takes hold, people will be more creative, they'll trust it, um, and we'll go from there. So right now my hope is 40 to 50% in the first three years of everything. Brian, what do you think? Oh, and, and now the second part of the question was which disciplines? Mm -hmm. So uh, chemistry, of, uh, very much so uh, biology, um, uh, biomedical research, chemical engineering, um, uh, material science. So it, it goes on and on at Carnegie Mellon. We have, a, we have a very broad umbrella over the University of Usage. Brian, do you have anything to add to that? No, that was that was pretty perfect. I think the, the maybe the way to think about it in terms of how it will complement existing technologies is similar to the movement we all made to data centers, right? Where initially you had to run all of your own local servers, and then these larger data centers came about, and you saw them first being built sort of institutionally, and then there are more global data centers that get run today, uh, you know, by huge financial institutions that are serving everyone up. And it doesn't mean that your computers go away. Certainly even if you're using AWS uh, or Google Cloud for something, you surely have PCs at your local site too, and you'll, you'll certainly have work that you're doing locally. Uh, but a lot of your daily driver work for that sort of uh, advanced capability in terms of the, you know, the commercial efficiency of getting access to that, the scale of getting access to that, so you can spin up you know, many, many servers simultaneously so that you can share that amongst a much broader community and share that cost uh, is so compelling in the long run that it changes a lot of your sort of daily driver activity. Right. I, uh, Keith just whispered to me, startup packages. So uh, when we hire assistant professors, we have to do lab renovations, which are incredibly expensive, and we have to fulfill this wish list individually of each assistant professor. And uh, for those of you in academic, there's, there's this little competition that goes on with assistant professors who got the better package from which university. Um, we are now negotiating time on the cloud lab with our assistant professors. And this is an efficiency that's built in that we will appreciate over the years because the, the um, lab renovations will go down. There will be more shared facilities when you do need a wet lab. Not everybody needs their own wet lab anymore that they move into and move out of 30 years later. Um, and uh, we'll be able to really maintain top level instrumentation because we don't have to buy one from, for every faculty member on campus. Yeah, thank you for the reminder. Yeah, I'm, I mean, it must. It, I would think it would also reflect in productivity because all of that um, startup package and renovation translates into time and lost productivity. Uh, literally, an assistant professor can come on day one and they're good to go. Yeah. They don't have to wait around for their lab to, to um, get complete. We actually, you know, we often hire uh, postdocs and wait for them to finish their postdoc. We have postdocs that are coming in January that have been working on the cloud lab already, and writing grants, and so it's we we're already seeing um, really exciting things. So I'm I'm so I suspect somewhat like Brian. Um, I'm very struck drawing parallels between where this could lead and the evolution of computing. So for example. Um, one of the things we've seen in computing is institutions working out these balances between when they use the public cloud, when they use local facilities or local cloud, and when they use certain very high-end uh, computational resources that are um, you know, national-scale resources. And I can readily imagine um, 
this coalescing, uh, you know, particularly as you have private and public cloud labs, um, uh, th this this coalescing with some developments in um, uh, central um, uh, instrumentation, high high priced, really high priced instrumentation, in a very similar kind of a way. Um, does that does that feel at all plausible? It, the analogy is pretty straightforward in my mind. Brian, you and I have talked about this. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think you've already seen that movement in some sense for the, I think the physicists are ahead of the life scientists in some sense. They know how to share telescopes in a way that's effective across the community where, you know, not everyone's going to have their own individual, you know, Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> Obviously, it has to be shared by the global community. Uh, and what's different about life sciences is often it's considered a sort of hand-to-hand -hand thing where you have to be doing the majority of your work locally, hands-on. Uh, and so really the transition there is we're just taking a lot of these daily activity uh, instrumentation and putting that on the cloud for, for more easy use. And it means it's very, it has to be very fast paced because you have to have this sort of daily access to it. But that same transition and definitely the same analogies of what's happened with data center technology, what's happened with you know, global sharing and other, and other uh, disciplines than the life sciences uh, should apply here too. Last question for me before I open it up to the audience. Um, I'm, I, the, I, I agree with you that this active learning coupled with experimentation is really looking like it's going to be a huge productivity multiplier. Um, and this, of course, makes coupling in active learning really easy. Um, how much of this are you actually seeing at this point, Brian? Are, 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 people, are people really starting to do that now, or is that still something that's kind of niche -y? Um I would say pretty much everyone either has an eye on it or actively has projects going in that space. Um, and it's been interesting to see, especially Carnegie Mellon has been at the forefront of publishing some of these new algorithms. There's a great paper that came out a while ago about uh, like I said, auto-optimizing experiments, which is very interesting where, uh, I don't want to poorly summarize the work, you should go look at the paper, but it's like, instead of telling the, the system like we have right now, this is exactly how I want you to run the experiment, it says, okay, th these are the degrees of freedom I can run on the experiment, and here's the outcome I'm looking for. Let's write code that automatically runs a series of experiments, analyzes those results, comes back and says, all right, we headed in the right direction, moving down, you know, some multidimensional surface, and then try again with, with another set of experiments to get you closer and closer to the prescribed outcome, which might be, say, isolating uh, a, a novel protein, or it might be trying to, uh, you know, get good mass spec resolution on the, the details of how to handle all the settings there. And then you're also seeing, and I think this is this is sort of even more cutting edge than the, the, the self-optimizing experiments, is the people who are writing these, these learning algorithms that can actively sit on the cloud What's kind of cool about the, the degree of granularity in the, the database uh, entries that are generated when someone runs an experiment on the cloud is just, it's, it's so uh, detailed because no one's doing any data entry. It's all the capture coming from all the metadata, all the stuff from the primary instrument, instrumentation is getting captured in as well. And so people can, can set active learners on the database and say, whenever anybody releases a new piece of say chromatography data, I want to completely update my training on my my model and then have an active model that every day is getting better when anyone across anywhere in the system, uh, you know, releases new data, it automatically reruns the training. Uh, so you can imagine just from just a, a physical standpoint, if you have to take what we're kind of at the state of the art right now with the publication goes into a journal and then sort of manually try to munge that data into the right format that's going to be useful for some learning algorithm at the end of the day, it's a very different step than, well, if the thing started in lived and breathed on the computer to begin with and everything was computational to begin with, it's not hard to start automating, connecting all those wires uh, to really get turbocharged on that, on that learning initiative. That is really cool. It, it kind of makes me wonder, for, not for all data, Brian, but um, there are certain synthetic data that maybe we don't have to store anymore because we can just reproduce it cheaper mm -hmm. than we can store it. 
just a thought. Yeah, no, it, I mean, it's, it's an analogy, again, with yeah. computing. You know, um, as computing has gotten cheaper, you sometimes say, I can recompute that um, cheaper yeah. than yeah. I can store right. it and right. take care of it same in the thing. long run. And you're going to be able to make exactly the same kind of uh, judgments here um, with all the data you need to reproduce the and, data. And again, not all science, but sure. I think there's a large portion of it. What you can kind of see that in, in little optimizations, too. There's stuff already in the lab, like, yeah. you know, we could do computational predictions of densities, but we just take a trip through the density meter. Yeah. First time we see the compound always, and that's, that's just another bit of code. The execution time of that is, is centered against, like, how long would the quantum computing take to figure this out? Yeah. Relative to, like, well, it's just going to physically mix up them silly, stick them in the machine, sure. and get a result back. And then that's, that, too, is executed through code. So what, in the end, is the difference in that execution? If it's tied to the physical thing or if it's tied to the, the purely computational thing. Let's open this up for questions from you. Um, uh, the floor is open. I bet you have a few. Re really liked your talk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I like your talk to you. Oh, good. <laughs> we, we have a fan club. I'm Rebecca. Hi. <laughs> uh, a couple of questions, uh, but I, I, I do want to first comment on something you said about grad students not needing to sleep, eat, or go to the bathroom. I wish you had told my advisor that. Um, <laughs> the two questions are actually about going to scale. I don't have any doubt that y you will have tons of demand for this, right? Mm -hmm. So one is operational, one is more strategic business-like. So. Back in the day when we didn't have access to computing the way we do through Amazon Web Services, we had batch queues, right? Yeah. So I'm completely behind the idea of the active learning. That's great. But can you imagine one thing about how you scale as having sort of these batch queues, like running jobs in slow, uh, slow batch mode? And the second is, how do you make sure you don't get acquired by Amazon? Or actually, is that okay? <laughs> Brian, I'm going to let you think about the second question. Um, yeah, so you can, you can, uh, uh, you know, you can batch these for sure. You just have your prioritization. Brian showed this. Um, so yeah, the batch, the batch question is the easy one. I'm going to take that one. Uh, easy peasy for sure. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just like computing, you know, it's just pr prioritization. Um, when, when an assistant, Brian, I'm buying time so you can think about an answer for the second question. <laughs> um, when an assistant professor buys threads, it's like cycles on a, on a, a compute system. We, we sell threads to the assistant professors. Those are their dedicated threads. But in a facility, which, you know, if other threads are available, then we just want to keep them busy, right? So it's just the analogy to computing is, mm -hmm. is solid for sure. All right, Brian, how'd I do in buying your time? No, yeah, that, was, that okay. was perfect. Yeah, absolutely. And, and part of what we do on the resource manager is actually slip in. You can imagine a lot of the work from facilities maintaining all these machines, qualifying all these machines, so constantly running controls on them to test that they're working nominally. And, you know, the traffic manager knows when there's a quiet moment and sneaks in a bit of maintenance, sneaks in a bit of uh, qualification, and that happens on the same execution system that all of the protocols do. We had a discussion at one point even for the batching, the farmers didn't like this, but I think academia would be much more open to it, of creating like, we, we were joking, we're calling it like the Uber pool version of an experiment where you're, you're like, well, my parameters are similar enough to this other experiment that's running that what if we just batch that together on like the same run on the, say the mass spec, for instance, uh, and, and do one run together as opposed to two individual runs. Uh, you can imagine why farmer doesn't like that idea, but <laughs> uh, for a cost saving measure, that makes a whole lot of sense, especially if your, your end goal is to publish the thing anyway. Why not? That makes that makes total sense. As to that question of uh, being acquired by Amazon, <laughs> uh, I would hope that we remain independent and see this technology through to the end of the day. I mean, one of the the the, the sort of uh, DJ and I have talked about this at length. But doing what we've done is the, the ten years of technology development that went into getting us as far as we did. Uh, was a, a huge investment, and there are much easier ways to make money than the way we went about doing things. So for us, as practitioners that wanted to use this technology, and really we built the lab we wanted to use, it's most important for us to see this technology become a sort of a new standard out in the world, and that everyone gets access to it, that we will have access to it in the future to do our own research. I very much imagine my own 
to retirement as being able to go in the cabin in the woods and run experiments all day if I wanted to for my computer. Uh, so for me, what's most important is whatever gets this technology out into the world in the, in the broadest way possible. Yep. Thanks. Do we have another question? Hi there. I'm Cody Hansen from the University of Minnesota. Thank you so Thank much. You. This is very exciting. Um, I'm curious, this is probably mostly a question for Brian, but I'm curious, and forgive me if I missed this, but what aspects of your uh, platform and execution system are proprietary and what aspects are open, thinking in terms of the, um, the open science and reproducibility mm -hmm. aspects of this? Is the, um, the notation for the experiments proprietary to an Emerald Cloud Lab or similar uh, lab, or is it something that uh, is open for uh, implementation anywhere? Right. So Thank the, you. Yeah. Very nice to meet you. Um, this is a legal partnership between, um, <laughs> so talk to a lot of lawyers, um, between Emerald and, and CMU. The, the software that ties all the instruments together is proprietary. Um, Brian, you want to take it from there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an excellent question. Because it, it is, as you it's, can imagine, a incredibly deep technology stack, because we've got to get all the way down to the bare metal and what's going on on the actual instruments, and then all the way back up to sharing the data and processing. A lot of what you saw in those screen shares is actually just the simple thing of data visualization. We found that we had to write like a single data visualization platform for everything, uh, because if you had to purchase the 200 different <laughs> visualization platforms that come out of each of the instrument vendors, that would also be cost prohibitive and, and not work. <laughs> so we had to sort of centralize things. The way it works right now is the the acquisition software that's tied to each instrument is still the manufacturer's acquisition software. So if, for instance, we're using an NMR or uh, from, you know, Brooker or the XRD from Regaku, uh, it's using their acquisition software. And so, you know, if you build one of these, you have to commercially purchase that in order to get the thing up and running, of course, at the end of the day. Now, all of them have data export, and um, very few of them have method import. And that's mostly where we do our fighting and try to write all the software interfaces at the end of the day. What we do right now is package it all up into this big database called Constellation. And that ontology is very public. Anyone can see who has access to the Cloud Lab, you know, uh, exactly what the ontology is. And it is uh, extremely sophisticated. We're up to, I think, 1,300 different data types with even more, uh, like 10 times as many of that different fields that are all indexed and, and controlled at the end of the day because of the, the intricacy of the data you produce. But all of that structure of the data is, is public and out there. The actual application we run, this thing called Command Center, is a collaboration between ourselves and actually Wolfram Research, so the folks who write uh, Mathematica. Stephen Wolfram and I work actually quite a bit together on the language and sort of the philosophy of that. We talk pretty regularly. He's a partner uh, with, with the company. Uh, and so, you know, if you, uh, if you wanted access to the, the like libraries of software that we put on top of that, which is this thing called Symbolic Lab Language, you might need to, for instance, purchase a copy of Mathematica to get access to that. Um, uh, if you have the exported notebooks or you get a, a copy of Command Center, which is not the ma major cost in getting access to the Cloud Lab anyway, which is our software to, to be able to integrate all that stuff at the end of the day. Furth further questions? Yeah. Going once. Thank you for the talk, William Kim at University of Rhode Island. I have a quick question about the um, sort of post experiment in the cloud lab. Uh, I'm curious about waste disposal after the experiment. So in the wet lab setting, I can see that the uh, bench science, the practice is highly automated in this cloud lab. But uh, waste disposal is also uh, performed by uh, staff in the lab setting physically, and you mentioned that you do not expect the uh, scientists to be actually visiting the lab, mm -hmm. if possible, mm -hmm. and things like that. But I'm mm -hmm. sure that there are some people involved it, coming in and stuff. It, so it, I was curious if that side is also more automated in this setting and how you are doing uh, there, there are tech, yeah, thank you. There are technicians uh, in the facility um, who are trained to, um, sometimes you do need humans to move things. Um, <laughs> um, so yes, there are technicians, in, trained technicians in the facility that are on, I've learned recently, on three shifts because it's 24-7, 365. Um, but they are not faculty and students. They're, they're, these are folks who are trained to be in a facility like this. So uh, yeah, they do, they do the waste management and things like that. And yeah. I, yeah. 
the, the waste looks pretty traditional. Uh, the one thing that I would mention that's kind of cool, that's interesting, that's new about the Cloud Lab is uh, you can, in, ad in advance of running an experiment, you can do the sort of forensic accounting. Yeah. One might do to sit down and say like, what is every microliter of source coming from? How much waste does that produce of what type? Uh, you know, how much plastic wear do I use? Of, of like exactly how many tips, like high pet tips I'm gonna use, et cetera. And because that stuff has to be provisioned for anyway by the resource manager, the, which is the, the big software system we write to sort of execute all the experiments, you can get a picture of exactly what that is down to the penny before you run an experiment. So I, I haven't seen anyone do it yet, but I think it would be really cool to see someone write an AI that, you know, instead of just optimizing for some experimental outcome, could optimize for produce the least amount of waste or, or spend the least amount of money on materials. Those are all things that are uh, now computationally accessible uh, and sort of connected to the, the experiments you run. This has real legs with the federal government for sure, right? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's a, whole, it's a whole discipline, optimizing your experiment, right? And with every aspect, waste, finances, it, it's really interesting to think about. Yeah, sure. It really is. We are at time. Um, Brian, thank you so much for coming in remotely for this conversation and for showing us around uh, the Emerald Cloud Lab. Um, Keith, Rebecca, thank you for a seriously mind-expanding um, presentation. And uh, I can't wait to see this in operation uh, next year. So. Please join me in thanking these fantastic presenters. And with that, we're done. I wish you safe travels uh, home. I wish you a good new year. And I hope that I will see many of you in San Diego in um I believe it's very late March, um, but uh, we, the dates are on the website. Uh, we will be doing a virtual event as well, and we'll be announcing plans for all that in the not-too-distant future. But enjoy your holidays, and thank you so much for coming and uh, joining us for this meeting. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all. <laughs>